Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Kate Schlesinger, Retail Solutions Advisor for the Center for Professional Executive Development, and I'm excited to be here today with you for you to hear Tim Buell about the current trends affecting the retail industry. But before I introduce Tim, I want to share with you some information about the Wisconsin School of Business's Center for Professional Executive Development, also known as CPED. CPED offers online and in-person programs and certificates that will give you the modern and relevant skills that you need to advance in your career. All of our programs are interactive learning sessions facilitated by our instructors like Tim with practical business experience. CPED also partners with organizations to help provide customized learning solutions and professional development programs, coaching, and consulting. Many of you that are joining us today are Badger alumni, and we're excited that you've come back to your alma mater to, to continue your professional development journey. If you want to learn more about all the things that we do offer, like seminars like this and in all of our courses, you can go ahead and check out our website at uwcped.org. I want to spend a couple minutes talking about a few of the logistics to help make this experience today as, as best as possible. So if you have any questions at all during the session, you can go ahead and use those, submit your questions in the chat function or the Q&A buttons at the bottom of the Zoom webinar screen that you will see. At the end, we're gonna, we're gonna propose all of your questions to Tim, but of course, if you have any relevant questions, you can raise your hand or you can also use that chat and Q&A. I'll be watching that. And Tim has given me full permission to interrupt him <laughs> if the question seems relevant. He really does want to make this as interactive for you as possible, although in this format, it's not always that case. So we will just make sure that we can interrupt Tim and ask those questions so they, they make sense. But either way, at the end, we will reserve some time. So that will be, again, I'll remind you on how to, how to walk through that. I'd also like to share with you that this session will be recorded and you will be receiving the link to the recording in a few days. So we're, we'd welcome you to share that with any of your colleagues or professional development friends that you feel like would value from this. And so now I would like to introduce to you Tim Buell. Tim is a lecturer at the Wisconsin School of Business in the marketing department. He teaches strategy and formulation, um, strategy formation, execution, finance, supply chain. I don't know, the list goes on and on, doesn't it, Tim? <laughs> but all at the Wisconsin School of Business. Um, and he's just a great partner for us at CPED as well. So welcome, Tim. We're very excited to have you with us today. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate the, the warm introduction and uh, greetings to all of our online attendees and, and greetings from the Wisconsin School of Business here in snowy Madison, Wisconsin. Our time together this afternoon is, is somewhat short and what I really want to accomplish is just to share some thoughts of the current business environment and, and, and as, we, as the session is entitled, what really is the new realities of sourcing and supply chain and retail? I think all of our attendees would agree we are living in a very dynamic environment. There are a lot of uh, different phenomena underway. And again, uh, from, from my academic perspective, as well as my participation in commercial activities, uh, I'd like to share with you my perspectives. But as Kate mentioned, I would really appreciate some audience participation. What makes this even more powerful for, for us presenting is to weave in some of your actual real life examples, experiences, perspectives, challenges, maybe areas where you've had some degree of success and make the next 35 to 40 minutes as impactful as possible. We will allow approximately five to 10 minutes at the end of the session for questions and answers. But again, if you have any, any, any thoughts you'd like to share during the presentation, please feel free to uh, either type in the chat uh, room or raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can to address those questions at that point in time. Our agenda for today is fairly simple. I want to give you a little bit of a background of myself, but spend the majority of the time talking about our current state and challenges and recommendations, uh, what, what we're seeing, and then how we think uh, proactive organizations uh, should respond. So here's who I am. So I am a triple badger. So I did my undergrad here in finance and accounting, went to work for the for firm, uh, Arthur Anderson, as an auditor for them, did a lot of work uh, with enterprise kind of sub $500 million a year organizations, as well as some larger multinational organizations, uh, did some merger and acquisition work, then uh, 
kind of found my way back here to the Wisconsin School of Business where I double majored in supply chain management and, uh, and, and marketing uh, in the Granger Center for Supply Chain Management. Spent about two years working at Triver Foods up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and then had an opportunity to be, be a very small part of a rather large turnaround uh, initiative as a black belt and a master black belt at uh, Tyco Corporation, first in Minneapolis at their plastics division, then down in Houston, Texas, uh, in their oil and gas business and, and valves and controls business, part of their flow control unit. And then finally in Princeton, New Jersey, as part of their, their, their strategy group. I left Tyco in uh, 2011 to go uh, first as a kind of an operational CFO and then as president and CEO of a food con con contract manufacturer down in the Chicagoland re region by the name of Packwright where we bought, ran, and then sold that business. And through my connection here, connections here at the University of Wisconsin, uh, was able to be introduced to an Australian-based company called IWS Lock and Charge, where I handled uh, their, their, their operations, their global operations, as well as their CFO. We did all of our contract manufacturing for this technology hardware, primarily in the form of carts and wall-mounted units for, for K through 12 technology. So the laptops, Chromebooks, iPads, et cetera and held that role from, uh, from approximately 2014 until 2018, at which point I transitioned the majority of my time to the Wisconsin School of Business where I'm a lecturer and kind of, kind of across three departments, uh, operations, marketing, which is where I, where I reside technically, as well as uh, occasionally uh, teach intermediate accounting. I also uh, am a fractional CFO for a healthcare tech company and do some work with CPED, both uh, in an instructional uh, capacity as well as a consultative capacity. So uh, really excited to be part of all of you, or part of the session with all of you attending and uh, look forward to the next few minutes of uh, time together. So I think it makes sense for us to get calibrated and, and just reflect a bit on kind of what our current state is, right? We see all types of news, we see all types of gyrations and iterations in the stock market. And I think this story from the Wall Street Journal back in, back in October is emblematic of what we're seeing in the retail space. So here we have a phenomena going into the holiday season where we see many of Macy's competitive peers uh, seeing market increases in their inventory balances. Uh, in this article, uh, Kohl's was, was called out as was Nike, Gap, et cetera. And the takeaway here is how did Macy's at this point in time navigate uh, kind of going into the holiday season and make sure that their, their inventory was appropriately sized for what was going on in the marketplace or what they anticipated going on in the marketplace. Now, one of the things that I'm very interested in is in the next week or so, uh, many retailers will be closing their fiscal year end at the end of January. And I think as those earnings are released in the following weeks, we'll see and get a really good understanding of not only how holiday sales performed, but also see how inventory uh, has, 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 has responded relative to those sales. And the reality that probably many of you are contemplating or, or already know and are facing is that if there is a disconnect between that consumer purchasing behavior and what we stocked for in anticipation of the holiday sales period, we're gonna see a degree of reconciliation occurring. And I think what was interesting in this article, again, from the Wall Street Journal back in October, is we had Macy's using, I'll call it a leading indicator, right? They looked at credit card data early in the year, revealing crap, uh, cracks in some shopping trends. And what this, mean, what this meant and what it could be interpreted is that as, consumers' ability to purchase, their buying power was eroded in this inflationary environment. Certain more discretionary categories were affected, right? And we see this as savings rates are, are, are coming down, as credit card balances are increasing, that consumers are preparing for kind of a potential recession and are preparing for the new, for the new reality of their inability to purchase as much as they used to. And what we see is this growing group of executives from finance, supply chain, merchandising, and planning departments discussing these changes, right? Trying to figure out for the respective organizations how they should prepare and ultimately respond. So again, 
this 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 article resonated with me and I said, geez, this is this is what I really want to at least introduce to the participants in today's call and get everyone to think about, huh, is there something from this that we can apply to our own organization? So let's start out with kind of what the current state is. Let's get, let's get calibrated on how we see the market performing and some of the realities that we're facing. So when we think about key issues that are present in the marketplace, we see kind of, kind of here, are, here are five top five observations. And again, I'd be interested in hearing some of your perspectives. That in certain circumstances, we have excess supply and low demand. So you have this disconnect between what is stocked in physical inventory and the demand streams and demand performance that, we, that, that we're realizing uh, in our current state. And this phenomena of the bullwhip, right, where we always seem to react and overreact to some of the marketplace phenomena, right? We go from an absence of inventory, stockout, shortages, empty shelves, to kind of this oversupply and excess inventory. And in circumstances where it's fashion oriented or there's a certain limited shelf life, this can be very, very damaging to an organization. And again, this is probably a reality that not only are many of you familiar with, but are probably grappling with in, in, in kind of our current times. The second somewhat indisputable uh, fact is that interest rates are, ri are, are, are rising. I mentioned before that we have this erosion of the purchasing power of consumers and an increasing cost of capital. And we'll talk about this a little bit further. For almost a generation, right? pretty much since the 9-11 attacks in 2001, we have had a very accommodating monetary policy, right? Cash has, for the most part, been relatively available and relatively inexpensive. We are seeing interest rates now that have not, have not occurred since the early 1980s. Well, why is this important? Well, all of a sudden, committing working capital balances to inventory, to accounts receivable, there's a, there's a more market cost to that. And not only is there a P&L consequence, but also from a cash availability standpoint, right? We may not have as much liquidity in our organization. And all of a sudden, this, this, this inventory not only has kind of storage implications as an excess and obsolete inventory implications, but the cost associated with it is more material. We are emerging from a post-COVID world. And the big question is, what is the new normal? We saw some very significant anomalies in consumer behavior throughout the, throughout the pandemic. And one of the observations is, is that the recession that we saw, the COVID-induced recession that we saw is unlikely to be the recession that we may enter into uh, during, during uh, calendar year 2023. And what we want to understand and, and try to get ahead of, much like Macy's did with some of their early indications from, from their credit card performance, is what does this new normal look like, right? What are changing customer preferences going to look like? And how is that going to translate into our inventory stocking position, our merchandising uh, strategy, how we see customers purchasing, and the quantities that we're seeing customers purchasing, right? It is highly unlikely if we enter into another recession, we are going to see uh, the amount of commercial sales of boats, for instance, right? That was kind of an anomaly when we think about kind of that COVID-induced recession, where in normal, normal recessionary times, discretionary and, and those more uh, durable good sales go down. But as people um, you know, stayed within their homes and, and, and were unable to travel and had a little bit of excess cash because of some of the stimulus that was available, we saw a unusual phenomena of certain categories outperforming their historical norms. You think about boat sales, you think about home improvement, furniture, et cetera. All of that is now correcting. Because of some of the inflationary uh, environment that we're experiencing, we see rising labor costs, energy costs, commodity prices. And we think about our ability to trans, uh, transfer those onto, onto our customers and their willingness to take on those price increases. And I think that is being challenged, right? You see consumers hitting a point of saturation. And traditionally, you see three primary mechanisms to 
restore margin strength, right? You can either take up price, which again, if that's getting challenged, uh, our ability to do that may be compromised. You see what's affectionately referred to as shrinkflation, where if you're selling units of items, you reduce the package count. Those of us who have gone to the store to buy cookies or whatnot may have noticed that, hey, that package is a little lighter than it used to be. And that, that can be intentional in order to uh, reinflate those margins. And then kind of the third variable that oftentimes is looked at is skimpflation, right? Is there a way that we can remove some, some, some higher cost components of a service, of a product or whatever your offering is and looking for ways to kind of take that cost out in, in hopes of, of, of expanding those margin dollars that we're looking for? And then when we think about kind of what this playbook for navigating a potential recessionary environment, as I mentioned before, the expectation is, is that this will resemble Sorry about this. It appears that Tim is having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Um, we will hold with him for just a minute and Hopefully his internet uh, straightens Hi, itself Hi, out. Oh, excuse me? Oh, Tim, we lost you there for just a couple of minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Are just you... the last few seconds. <laughs> okay. Wait, was I talking about high-end foods and wines? Were you, you were, to yes. It was okay, the, very the good. last very... thing that we got was removing a high-quality uh, element from something. Yes, exactly. So, so, so the key takeaway here is that if you're selling high-end home products, be it food or furniture or whatnot, it is highly likely that consumer performance will resemble more of what you saw in 2008, 2009 economic correction and the early 2000s kind of tech bubble uh, economic correction versus what we saw kind of post-COVID-19, where people, as they reacquainted themselves with their kitchens and were willing and able to invest in higher-end products, and, and, and food and other types of components, that, that, that consumer preference is likely to, to, to change, right? We're, we're probably not going to see a, a, a repeat of, of, of what we saw during the, the COVID pandemic. And therefore, we have to dust off and, and, and rethink and maybe, maybe revision, uh, re-envision what that playbook, what our organizational playbook looks like for navigating potential recessionary environment. One of the things we want to reacquaint ourselves with is kind of the, the strategy, our, our supply chain strategy, as well as our supply chain network. And when we think about all of these interdependent aspects, we want to remind ourselves of the fact that our supply chain and our procurement strategy should cascade down from what our organizational strategy is. What do we want to be known as by the segments which we are trying to pursue? Do we want to be viewed as more efficient and functional, or do we want to be viewed as being more responsive and innovative, right? Do we want to be a Ford or a Walmart, or do we want to be a Saks Fifth Avenue or Porsche? And the reason why I bring this up is as we figure out kind of what we want to be as an organization, that will directly affect kind of this reality of our sourcing and supply chain. Right? What is the number of what are the number of goods we want to stock? What is the variety of goods? And what are the implications across the entire supply chain network? Right? If we have, if we have either vertically integrated production facilities or we rely on sourcing partners to, 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 to provide us with the wares and the goods and whatever we happen to sell. How do we how do we transact that relationship? What are the transportation consequences, right? Now, some of the good news is that transportation costs in general are starting to come down from what we saw uh, during the summer of 2022. I think one of the most market examples of that is international container costs, right? Certain organizations, some of which I've actually worked with, we're seeing container costs of $25,000, $30,000 containers, and now that collapsing to sub $10,000 and maybe even in some cases sub seven dollars or $8,000 um, that, that, that influences kind of not only your sourcing strategy, but it also is a bit of a predictive indicator that, geez, this global supply chain may be slowing down. And what are the implications? You know, the question should be asked, what are the implications of that to your respective business? And how do you make sure that you prepare yourself for, for this potential inevitability? 
inventory, I think, is going to be an area of, of, of intense recommended scrutiny, right? What are you storing? What are you housing? What customers are you, are you trying to pursue? And what are the opportunities? And we'll go into the opportunities and kind of the action plan here momentarily for managing and de-risking those inventory environments or, or inventory investments. Because again, there is a cost from a capital financing cost associated with holding those inventory balances that has not been really present for the last uh, few decades information availability, and not only the information, but what insights can be gleaned from that information. And being creative in thinking about things in maybe non-traditional ways, similar to what Macy's did, where they saw that credit card information and they said, geez, this is likely a predictive indicator. And if our consumers are not keeping up with with, with inflation and their ability to buy certain items is being diminished. And we sell primarily discretionary items that will translate into a di direct implication to our business. And if we know that is the case, how do we respond? How do we prepare? How do we de-risk kind of our supply chain network to be a little bit more agile in this, in this somewhat unknown environment? And then, then again, the four kind of P's of the marketing mix. What's our price, our place, our promotion, the product itself, and our ability to collapse certain SKUs into a more master SKU standpoint, and again, de-risking our overall supply chain network is something that you know can be contemplated. So here are some recommendations. And when I was putting this together, I, I thought of former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and he had this interesting saying. He said, "You know, in life, there are kind of three categories of events." You have your known knowns, right? There are things we know we know. We know that the cost of money is going up. We know that as a society, we are emerging from a once in a century uh, pandemic. We know that buyers are different. We know that there are recessionary rumblings on the horizon. These are known knowns. So that's kind of the first category. Then you have what's affectionately known as unknown unknowns, or known unknowns, excuse me. We know there are certain things we don't know. We don't know exactly how that consumer behavior is going to change. We don't know exactly how aggressive, from a monetary standpoint, uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve is going to be. We don't know on a global uh, geopolitical standpoint how this war in Ukraine is going to is is, is going to uh, end and 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 kind of play out over the next couple of weeks, months, and years. These are things we know we don't know. And then, kind of the third category of items is the unknown unknowns. There are things we don't even know we don't know. We did not know, and I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, did not have in your fiscal 2020 budget a once in a century global pandemic, right? That is something that no one ever thought of happening, right? No one thought in the fall of 20, uh, 2001 that we would have attacks here in the United States on 9-11, right? These are things we didn't contemplate, but yet had significant, and in some cases, catastrophic implication on our businesses. So knowing these three categories, here are some areas of recommended uh, investigation and scrutiny. So first of all, this idea of having a renewed and heightened emphasis on sales and operations planning or sales inventory and operations planning. We'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but this is something where we balance what we feel is going to be the consumer behavior with our inventory and operational investments, with the cost of capital and the availability and access of our respective organizations to that capital, and putting that all together in a way that as a business, we can choose what we stock, where we stock it, how we merchandise it, and what segments we're trying to pursue. Second of all, this, this protection and be very judicious of the use of cash and overall working capital deployments. What are our inventory investments? Is there opportunity in our contractual terms to mitigate and, 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 and reduce our risk profile? Is there a way that we could take on a more, more FOB destination kind of ownership and, and, uh, standpoint, right? Where, we, where we, we, we take on ownership of, of, of a certain item. Are there return rights? Are there payment terms? 
are there ability, one of the things that I've done with this uh, healthcare tech company that I'm working on and some of the SaaS contracts that we have is looking for ability during the contractual term to terminate, uh, terminate the relationship based more on our discretion. Uh, is there a, a removing auto renewal terms, right? So these things don't just kind of automatically evergreen. Is there a way that we can uh, reduce kind of the, the, the amount of goods that are coming in as we review and reconcile kind of our current inventory balances with what we're seeing from a sell through standpoint? And if we conclude that, 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 that we're a bit overstocked in certain categories, is there a way that we can kind of, kind of reduce the amount of product that's coming in? And then this whole idea of make versus buy, right? For those of you who are in attendance that make your own product, is there an opportunity to uh, look for outsourcing capability instead of buying the manufacturing capacity? Is there a way from a working capital deployment standpoint to, to uh, engage in a more thorough and comprehensive way uh, strategic sourcing partners? partners and manufacturing, co-manufacturing partners, right? This is a great way to get the products and services that you may need without committing some of the capital that's oftentimes necessary to build out those capabilities. For firm voice of the customer investigation with both proactive and reactive survey tools, right? I don't think uh, there, there's much we can do these days without getting some type of a reactive survey tool, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how was your experience, et cetera but really doing kind of that deep dive customer analysis to A, figure out areas that we can develop our product and our offerings in a way that become more compelling to our consumers that allows us to differentiate ourselves and ideally price more aggressively relative to our competitive peers. So that's on the price take up side of, of, of the equation. You also want to look at the price, or excuse me, the cost take outside of the equation where we can ask ourselves, are there certain attributes of our product, material, components, service levels that we're providing, right? That customers like, but they're not necessarily willing to pay for, nor will they change their consumer, uh, consumer buying habits if we reduce that service, right? The United States Postal Service did something, uh, some of this recently, where they said, you know what, we can cut costs if we spread out or elongate the time it takes us to deliver to deliver your mail. And because of that, are consumers happy with it? Probably not. They'd like to get their mail in a day or two instead of three to four, or whatever the new norm is. But are they willing to pay more to get their mail in a day or two? And most likely the answer is no. So that's an example of, an, of, of a product attribute that customers like, but they're not necessarily willing to pay for, nor are they willing or nor are they likely to change their consumer habits if you remove that. And then finally, prepare a more traditional recession version, uh, prepare for a more traditional recession versus the COVID recession. I talked about that a moment ago, where instead of, of preparing for, you know, kind of, kind of certain expanded and, 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 and heightened levels of consumer purchasing, as we saw during COVID, kind of baseline on what we saw in, in previous recessions. So sales and operations planning, uh, when we talk from a strategic standpoint, SNOP, scrutinize stocking schemas. Now, traditionally where I've seen with companies I've worked for and clients that I work with, this is a very granular exercise, right? And due to the magnitude of many of the SKUs that, 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 that organizations hold, you have to take this on in a graduated way, right? If you're, if you're in organizations with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of SKUs, this can be kind of a, an overwhelming endeavor. But I think what, you, what, what most, if not all organizations are able to do is do a bit of a Pareto analysis, see what are those key SKUs that drive 80% of your, of your revenues, and then look for ways to collapse slower or, or lesser performing SKUs into those SKU balances. Look at your replenishment schemas, right? And whether those are still, still, uh, uh, still relevant to the new environment. Understand what drives your consumer behavior. Maybe switch some of the items that you stock to a make to stock instead, or should we make to order instead of make to stock where it automatically replenishes. The result of this is not only to have a better inventory assortment, 
but also remove unnecessary inventory that is consuming your working capital. And where I've seen this done correctly, and I've, I've run some of these teams personally, is not only are you able to reduce your absolute dollar of inventory investment, but you're able to increase your fill rates and increase your forecasting capability and forecasting accuracy. Because you're asking the right questions, you're looking into kind of that end user. It, for those of, of for organizations that may sell into distribution, I would recommend you look at sell through performance at the retailer level to see exactly uh, what's going out to the ultimate kind of point of sale consumer. This also will allow you to identify potential bulges of inventory in the supply chain to see if, if uh, some supply chain partners decide that they're going to destock because they may be a little bit overstocked, how that will affect your, 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 your specific organization. It can also give you insight into the availability of key products to make sure you don't have stock out uh, situations. Reinvigorate your sales and operations team. Coordinate supply plans with dem uh, demand and commitments, right? Make sure that, that you, you actively engage and in many ways hold accountable those representatives from a demand planning standpoint. One of the positions I always took is as, as the supply organization, either through procurement or through, through ops and manufacturing, that we will provide the commercial side of the business whatever you want, but we want you to tell us who the intended customer is, what the specific SKU is, the quantity you want, not to necessarily punish you if you get that wrong, but at least try to recreate the logic that made that decision in the first place and hopefully learn from that if the outcome was not what we predicted. Resume this monthly rig uh, rigor of the SNOP process, and that's what we see in the schematic at the lower right-hand corner. And then address slow moving and excess inventory at the SKU level. Where I've seen organizations get themselves in trouble is they look at inventory terms, uh, turns or inventory investment kind of in aggregate. And you may have certain items that are, that are high performing SKUs that just to hit that aggregate turn number, you actually understock those items that are supporting your business. Instead, what I, had cha what I challenge you to do is look at what I affectionately refer to as the inventory sludge, those slow moving excess and obsolete items that are just sitting in your inventory with limited to no turns and figure out A, how we make sure we don't replenish those items, but also B, is there an opportunity to sell some of these items taking in that working capital oftentimes or sometimes at the expense of taking a loss on that item. And really having that conversation of, yes, we may be able to get some cash out of this inventory, and we realize that we may take, have to take a P&L hit in order to do this. Um, many times that's actually a healthier decision for an organization, although politically it can be a bit, uh, a, a bit of a tenuous situation as you may, you know, as it has that PL PL consequence. Moving on to the second recommendation here. When we look at our working capital investments, right? Inventory is the lifeblood of many organizations, but it also, if you get the assortment and, and kind of those investments wrong, can also be, you know, an absolute weight around the neck of an organization. So because of this, there's kind of three high level recommendations. First of all, you wanna understand and confirm the logic behind the inventory investments, right? This idea of the inventory sludge, where are we, which SKUs are we making our, our money from? Which SKUs have, have, have been, have been um, underperforming and therefore A, we wanna make sure we don't, we don't replenish them, but B, how do we get rid of the investments that we have? Asking yourself, is there an opportunity to increase fill rates and forecast accuracies while reducing absolute dollar, dollar value of, in, of, 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 of inventory investment? This is where sales and operations planning and a SNOP leader that can scrutinize the data, look at a skew level at, at inventory investments that may be underperforming, looking at inventory investments where maybe you're actually a little bit light and that could compromise your ability from a revenue standpoint and trying to find that appropriate blend within your company. Look for skew rationalization opportunities and that collapsing of, of certain peripheral skews into kind of that master skew, uh, master skew. 
Contractual terms, talked about this briefly. Embed early termination terms into long-term contracts with a somewhat uncertain business environment. Right? When we look at economic terms, when we look at consumer preferences, when we look at innovation that's occurring, we wanna make sure that as the business envir environment rapidly shifts direction, that we can be as, as agile and responsive as an organization as possible. And oftentimes long-term, very, very prescriptive and inhibiting contracts prevent us from doing that. So we could still be heading in one direction as the entire market has shifted and, and headed in a new direction. Auto renewals, try to remove that when possible. Prepare for pushback on requests to extend payment terms and collection of receivables. You know, many of your suppliers are doing the same math that you are. And as the cost of working capital increases, um, their willingness to extend their payment terms will probably be reduced or you'll get some pushback on that. Their willingness to take consigned inventory or to keep inventory on your behalf before you replenish I, th I think you're going to get more pressure in that area. So just be prepared for that. And then finally, heightened reliance on suppliers in this make versus buy environment. Identify opportunities to reduce capital investments, plants, machinery, equipment. Staffing oftentimes is an investment that organizations are faced with. Focus on this flexibility, understanding and appreciating the dynamic nature of the environment that we're in right now and how we can be responsive as well as keeping an eye on our absolute dollars of cost, as well, again, as well as those absolute dollars of inventory investment. Utilize suppliers to assist in the early identification of consumer trends, reaching into your suppliers and using them as a resource, kind of boots on the ground and weaving their insights, observations, maybe even some high level um, uh, de-identified information of what some of their other customers are doing and weave that into your sales and operations uh, planning process to get a better idea of what kind of that consumer behavior is likely to look at. Voice of the customer, product development, product evolution, make sure that we're, 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 we're not providing uh, attributes that people are not willing to pay for. And at the same time, identifying certain attributes that uh, consumers are willing to pay for and further differentiates your product or your overall offering. Understand, again, at the attribute level, what customers value and are willing to pay for, combined with a cost to serve analysis. This is what we talked about moments ago. And then finally, identify and pursue early customer trends and turn into a strategic advantage. Either we're to double down or pull back on investment. And this is, this is an example of, 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 of a consumer trend, or excuse me, of a, of a of a supplier or merchant trend that is changing. And maybe some of you have, have, uh, have done something similar in your own businesses where this idea of free returns, right? And almost an unlimited timeline to do them, that is being challenged, right? And as organizations are looking at some of the cost elements and the more comprehensive cost drivers in their business, they realize that this whole return phenomena is something that's probably, probably gotten a bit out of control and are there some limitations that we can put around our return process to still be responsive to our customers and consumers in a reasonable way, but remove some costs from our, from our business? And then finally, navigating through this, this potential recessionary environment, consumer behavior expected to be different than during the COVID-19 recession. We talked a bit about kind of what we're seeing from a, from a credit card debt standpoint and the erosion of, 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 of savings rates kind of kind of collectively looking across uh, the entire consuming segment. And this is going to be a real thing. And where are we going to hit a, a, a saturation point where consumers really have to cut back on their spending because either they're out of money or they're out of borrowing capacity and how that reverberates through the economy and through your, your, your individual businesses. Determine the necessity and stickiness of your product service and or general offering. That is likely to give you some insight into as consumers are unwilling or unable to spend and they have, a pri have to prioritize where they use their now diminished dollars, uh, whether or not your product offering service is going to be top of that list or towards the bottom of the list and how do you, how do you sculpt your business to respond. And finally, be proactive and be pro protective of cash 
and make unnecessary commitments. You know, cash to a business is, is like what altitude is to a pilot, right? You may have a problem in your business or you may have a problem in your airplane. And if you have more altitude, you have more time to figure out not only what the problem is, but an appropriate response. Similarly, if you can inject cash into your business, be, be judicious with how that cash is being used, knowing that there is a degree of uncertainties and the only thing that's always right about forecasts is that they're wrong, you can better prepare and respond to what inevitably comes, comes in the next weeks, months, and, and potentially years to come. And that is all I have to share at this point in time. I'd love to open up the floor to, to questions, comments, observations, maybe areas of dispute, and really, really kind of kind of spend the last five minutes just kind of kind of talking collectively and, and, and seeing what's going on out there. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. So with that, we are opening up the, the box so you can go to the, your chat and you can ask questions in there. And you can also go to the Q&A box. So we'll give you a minute to find that. It is located along the bottom panel of your screen, most likely, depending on your configuration. We did get a couple of questions during. Um, so I will I will do those while you are <laughs> typing away other questions that you might have. Um, one of the questions that came in um, was, was related to um, the, let me just go here, was related to the, the refund example. So they like the voice of the customer. Do you have examples of any other policies or changes that you might see that would reflect the voice of a customer and things that might change due to supply chain demand? Yeah, so I, I, I think, I mean, in, in some ways, we as consumers have been, been a bit spoiled. Mm -hmm. um, I see, first of all, from a supplier state, you know, if, 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 if you're a merchant, um, I, I think you will see customers not being as willing to spend for high, high priced items. I think some of the other trends from a voice of the customer standpoint that, that as a business you could maybe push through that they may not like is, is payment terms, right? Making sure that, that maybe there's more front end payment, again, thinking about the true cost of capital. I think that's probably a little bit more relevant in the B2B uh, retail space than, mm -hmm. than, than in, the, in the true consumer retail space. I think that's gonna be changing. This whole idea of, of you know, kind of looking at the three levers of taking up price, skimflation, and shrinkflation, right? Re-engineering your product, understanding um, quantities. I think you're going to see a reduction in the number of items that retailers are willing to stock, both in absolute quantity, but also at all, right? As you may have some retailers saying, you know, these, these items are available in store, but these items you can order online. And oh, by the way, for the first time in X amount of time, you may actually have to pay for the shipping. So I think that's something else that as consumers, we may have been a little bit spoiled as, 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 as merchants are looking at the cost of not only free shipping, but free returns. How is there a way that they can, they can kind of reduce that financial impact? So those are just a, a few examples off the top of my head. Perfect. Thank you. We had one other question come in. It looks, I don't know if there's any others yet. Um, what might you consider the most impactful change that you've seen organizations in the retail, you know, a storefront environment make since post-COVID reality of sourcing and supply chain? Yeah. So, so I think it's, it's, it's the inventory that they're stocking, right? Their, their, their whole merchandising and inventory plan. I think kind of pre-COVID, we seem to have an explosion of SKUs, right? We're, as we're trying to pursue these more and more niche kind of, kind of segments and sub-segments. You've seen Coca-Cola do this. You've seen other, other manufacturers that have, have literally cut half of their SKUs. And I think that is something that as we saw these unpredictable consumer behaviors, there was more of a return to core product, right? The center of the store kind of came alive during COVID. And I think that is something that, that, that not only changed, but it'll be interesting to see what that new norm looks like, right? 
as consumers, are we going to return to restaurants or now have we fallen back in love with our kitchens and eating at home and you know, that coupled with trying to take some expense out of that, that, eating, that, 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 that eating category, what's that new norm gonna look like? But I think there's been a lot of change with kind of what's being offered to consumers and that relates to you know, skew simplification as well as kind of where the channel through which you buy certain items. Excellent, thank you. There's another question that just came in. This is in more of the SNOP space, um, but how can teams get closer to their customers to better predict demand, better demand planning? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of things. I think social media can be a tool for doing this, seeing like in getting ahead of, of, of certain phenomena as far as, as consumer preferences, you know, you think about organic, right? And, and where that came from over the last, um, you know, last, last decade or so and how Whole Foods was one of the first movers in that. And then, you know, kind of, kind of a lot of the other in the grocery space, the retailers followed. I think you have customers, especially this kind of new generation of millennials and, 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 and you know, kind of the Gen, Gen Y and Gen, Gen Z folks being willing to pay more for a product that means something and is ego expressive of who they are as an individual, right? Where you see, you know, ESG kind of components being woven into not only the product design, product or service design, but also the communication strategy, right? These are our key bullet points. I was in Northern Wisconsin this weekend and bought myself a 24 pack of water and on the brand that I bought, it is conspicuously labeled that that bottle is made out of, 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 of recycled material, right? That was not by accident, right? So trying to figure out what resonates at the segment level with those customers. And sometimes that's observation. Sometimes that's focus groups. Sometimes it's pointed experimentation, right? Where you just try something ridiculous. I mean, if you think about where Amazon Prime came from, Right, that was an employee's idea, and everyone kind of shook their head. But all of a sudden, it was quickly determined that they were onto something, right? And that became a cornerstone of not only their business strategy, but also kind of who they were as an organization, and then set the trend for the entire market. So, do not um, be afraid or hesitate to try just kind of outlandish ideas, right? And try it. Maybe maybe do a consumer group, or maybe you have a focus group, or you have a certain geographical location you want to try something out in, and try to find that next truly bizarre idea that all of a sudden becomes the new norm, right? So there is that creative aspect. And one of the concerns I have, and I even sometimes see this in industry as well as with some of my students, is there's an over-reliance on the technology tools right? The, the, the demand planning tool told me to buy this. Well, why? Well, it just did, right? And no demand planning tool predicted COVID. No demand planning tool, you know, will, 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 will predict kind of what the new post-COVID norm looks like. You have to use human intelligence and experimentation and ingenuity instead of, well, the, the magic box told me to do that. You've got to, you've got to be you got to push a little bit more and, and, and think creatively. And I think that will be the point of differentiation between a good company and a great company that absolutely thrives in this new environment. Excellent. I'm just checking here. Oh, we have another question. Oh, sorry. How have you seen volatility and exchange rates impact global supply chain with geopolitical changes underfoot? Do you have any predictions for the next six months? Yeah, I, I think you're going to see a lot of redomestication or the attempt to redomesticate supply chains. Um, I think there is a skepticism on the on the logic and the the invulnerability. I don't even know if that's the word of global supply chains. I think people are now saying, "Geez, it's not a guarantee that we will be able to get our products from Taiwan." or from China, or from, you know, kind of kind of pick your country. And in many ways, organizations, as their supply chains have become more global, and, and you know, COVID certainly, cer certainly impacted this to some degree, um, there was a vulnerability, right? There were stockouts. I mean, the CHIPS Act was not done 
you know, because people didn't have anything else to do, right? It was a national strategic security issue, you know, that we relied collectively as a country so much on internationally sourced microchips and all organizations who use them felt the implications of that, right? There are certain critical supply chains from pharmaceutical ingredients to key componentry to food items that I think you're going to see a, a, a shift to more um, domesticated supply chain and in, in the pre-qualification of alternative suppliers, right? Kind of this, the, and the pendulum inevitably shifts from a sole source to a multi-source, but I think you're going to have a little bit more of a portfolio approach to mitigate risk versus an entire, uh, an entire focus or a more weighted focus on just cost takeout. Perfect, thank you. Well, thank you, Tim. I think that at this point, there don't seem to be any additional questions. We wanna thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Before we end, I do just wanna let you know that CPAD is ready to help your organization adapt to any new strategies to respond to, the, to these trends that you're seeing, really to help you meet the changing customer and you know, trends. I would love to set up a discovery session with you. So if to, you can see my information here is on the screen, but I'm able to walk you through. I can make those great connections to people like Tim and our many of our instructors and faculty. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me via the slide. My email is there and I really do look forward to exploring all of these opportunities with your organization. As we lean in together and we address the, the challenges that the retail industry is facing, I believe that we are stronger together and we can work together. So thank you so much for your time today and we look forward to connecting in the future.